It's an honor to be here, alhamdulillah. I uh, did not pull the fire alarm to escape my session. Those of you who said they saw me leaving, uh, it was just a good opportunity to use the bathroom. But anyways, um, you know, these, these moments are very special moments. I was just talking to somebody downstairs in the bazaar I brought my, uh, my family this year, my son Musa is five, my daughter Mu uh, Iman is three, uh, my wife and I, we, we all came here as a family this year and uh, subhanAllah I'll say something that I think a lot of us don't realize. I grew up going to conferences in Chicago. Chicago for many years was the mainstay for ISNA. It's still till today, Mass ICNA of course, the sister conference of uh, this ICNA conference is held annually in Chicago every year. And I grew up, um, you know, I, I would say spoiled by the fact that every year, every few months, we knew that there would be some large, like massive Muslim gathering where everybody in the gathering would know how to say my name correctly. Everybody would be able to respond to my salam. And like Musa was shocked to find out that the pepperoni on the pizza here is halal. And I, and, and I joke about that, but in, in, a, in a weird way, it's very serious. The gatherings where you come for a weekend, you know, to Baltimore or to Chicago, or wherever you travel for these conferences, and on a smaller scale, what YM does is provide an environment that is safe and that is meaningful and nurturing for the identity and for the heart of Muslims. I don't know if Musa is going to remember anything from this trip. I don't know if he learned anything. My daughter Iman, I don't know. I mean, they got their face painted. That was pretty cool. But beyond that, the one value that I think touches me the most is that for 72 hours, as they walk through a hallway of a public building, they're going to look and see other people who share their name, who share their belief, share their faith, and have love for each other for the sake of Allah alone. These moments are very valuable. Don't let this day or this session or this weekend pass you by without saying Alhamdulillah. That Allah Ta'ala gave you this opportunity to come together for His sake. And even if you don't bring home anything or remember anything, these moments will be things that you cherish. I'm 34 years old now. My conferences when I was younger, I used to go when I was not even a teenager, when I was 10, 11, 12, I used to pull fire alarms, just like that kid who probably pulled this one. All right, he's definitely out there, and he's definitely Arab. Anyways, uh, I'm just saying, look, I'm Arab, I can say that. I was the bad Arab kid that was pulling fire alarms. I know you guys all think I'm a convert. My dad converted. Okay. So I wanted to share just a small reminder. I don't want to take too long. I know that Asr is, is coming up, and I don't think that there's any value in talking for like an hour, hour and a half. So I'm just going to, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, you know, مَا قَلَّ وَكَثَى خَيْرٌ مِمَّا كَثُرَ وَأَلْهَى That whatever is short, and, is, and it's, it's, it's sufficient, it's enough, it's better than that which is too much, and it distracts. So there's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu One of the gifts he was given amongst many was the gift known as Jawami al-Kalam, which is a ability, a talent, a God-given gift to be able to keep things brief and to the point. And this hadith that I'm going to share with you, that's narrated, and the Prophet ﷺ has said in this hadith, is one of those examples. There was a man who came to the Prophet ﷺ, this guy shows up, in the gathering of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, O Messenger of Allah, says, Please, Ya Rasulullah, guide me and point me to an action, a single thing that I can do, that if I do it, I will earn 
and I will become beloved to Allah, but at the same time, I will become beloved to everyone around me. Teach me something that will make me beloved, that I won't have any haters. Allah will not hate me and people won't hate me. So the first thing that's interesting about this hadith, that I want to stop here and pause, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and innately we have a need, we have an appetite to feel, number one, and to experience Allah's love. It's something that we yearn for. But also, number two, the love of people. The acceptance of people. And this is something that we need to come to terms with. Now, we don't do everything that we do because we want to obtain the love of people. We don't give up our principles and our beliefs and our behaviors because we want to be liked. But there's nothing wrong with a person wanting to be appreciated and wanting to have good standing with their friends and their family and their community. It's part of the fitrah that Allah Ta'ala designed us with. So this man is coming to the Prophet Sallallahu and he's asking him about how to attain a certain level or a status in life and both of these things are important to have a good spiritual quality of life. But what you find is that he doesn't group them together, right? He says, give me guidance to something that will give me the love of Allah and then will give me the love of people. So although it's natural to want to be loved, right, and have people tell you that, hey, I appreciate you, I love you, it's normal, it's natural, right? But at the same time, we learn from this question and the answer of the Prophet ﷺ likewise is that what? There is an order, there's a priority. And that is that we need to first understand and seek the love of Allah before we concern ourselves with trying to obtain the love of people. There's an order, right? If I had a car that had to be maintained, my car needed some little bit of uh, uh, shop work, right? It needed new tires and it needed a new battery. Which one do I change first? Anybody? You're like, you just call Ammi and Abu and they'll figure it out, right? No. You change the battery. Thank you. Because why? You can't go to the tire shop and get new tires unless your battery's working. So there is an order sometimes. There is a tartib. There is a sequence. There's a prioritization that a person has to follow. So the first thing that we understand, the theme of this is detach to reattach is that there is an action in which the Prophet ﷺ here teaches us about and this action is the secret to knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. Many of us wonder like, how do I know if Allah loves me? I'm trying, I'm doing my best, but is there anything that I can do that will give me, you know, a, a progress report, will tell me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me? And the answer is what the Prophet ﷺ says here. He says, Izhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah. That if you do zuhud, zuhud is the action of, they say, al arad an ashya, like turning away from things. Wa ihtiqaran fi yani. Like you, you don't put value in that. It doesn't change your life, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, if you can do this in the dunya, in your life, be a person of zuhud, then Allah will love you. Now what does it mean for a person to be a zahid, to do zuhud? Many of us misinterpret this and we say, oh, this person can't have nice things. This person can't have, you know, a phone or an iPad. They can't enjoy sports or they can't enjoy art or their friendships. They have to be a tough person, right? They have to be, uh, you know, grumpy and they have to be grouchy and they just got to be focused on the akhirah and that's it. That's not a Zahid. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that a Zahid is somebody that can experience all of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible, but that those things do not affect their inner reality. Let me give you an example. How many of you, if you show up to dinner tonight, let's say your friends call you, invite you for dinner, and you show up, and you walk in, and all of your favorite items are there, Right? What kind of food do you guys like? Anybody? Biryani, mashallah. Chicken, 
Chicken or goat? Lamb. Okay, mashallah. Right? What's up, what we got over here? Sushi. Wow, mashallah. Hey, sushi biryani, I'm just saying. Also known as a poke bowl. Yeah, basically, right? Right? So you walk in and you see biryani, you got sushi, you got ribeye, burgers, french fries, wings. It's a buffet. You walk in and they're like, bismillah, enjoy. Sorry for the three people I just woke up here in the front, all right? You would be super happy, right? Smile from ear to ear. This is amazing. What, what jannah have I just walked into? Okay? You'd be the happy, alhamdulillah, right? Alhamdulillah, alladhi at'amana wa saqana wa ja'alnana min al-muslimi. You make that dua with so much, you put your whole foot in that dua, right? Okay? Now let's change positions a little bit. Your friend invites you and says, hey, you want to have some food? You say, yeah. They say, we don't have much, but, you know, come join. You show up, and there's some rice and some lentils, some dal chow. You walk in, you're like, uh, is, uh, does, is Grubhub working, or what's, what's the deal, right? Can we door dash some kebabs? Like, is this the appetizer, right? This is normal. It's normal for people to have a sense of expectation and disappointment. But the Zahid doesn't feel any difference in those situations. The Zahid doesn't, doesn't only eat dal chawl or drink only water or have only one date and sit there quietly. The Zahid has no spiritual movement internally towards Allah, whether they are given exactly what they want or whether they are given something that they don't want. There's no distraction. And it leads to this miraculous personality trait of constantly being grateful. So zuhud is the state where a person is so grateful to Allah about what they have, that they have no time to think about what they don't have. My wife's grandfather, may Allah have mercy on him, used to be a very jolly, jolly guy, right? And his wife would ask him, especially when times were tough, like, you know, things were not going well, she would say, why are you so happy all the time? You know, like, you know, serious things would happen, right? They'd have like some issue and, you know, the water was shut off or the construction was happening or whatever. It was a tough time sometimes, sickness in their home. And he would always just be very happy. And his wife said to him, why are you so happy all the time? Like, can't you just join in the family venting circle? You know, everyone likes to pile on sometimes. And he said, if I thanked Allah for every second of the day, for something I had, I would run out of the day before I would run out of things to thank him for. How, how can I be unhappy when Allah has given me more than I can even imagine? This is zuhud. This is a zahid. It's irrelevant whether you get Coke or Sprite or water or nothing. The Prophet ﷺ would come home. والسلام, would ask his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu anha, like, what is there to eat? And she would say, Ya Rasulullah, nothing. And he would say, good, I'll fast. Because he hadn't eaten yet. And when you haven't eaten yet, in a, in a, in a, in a non-Ramadan fast, in a nafil fast, you can make your intention late. As long as you haven't eaten, right? I don't want you brothers being like, 3 p.m., already had brunch, lunch, you know? Allahumma inni sa'im. Like, you know, like, no. Your intention has to be coupled with the, 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 the precondition that you haven't eaten yet or drank anything yet or done anything to violate the fast for that day. So imagine a husband coming home, a father coming home and asking his wife after working in the morning and being like, what is there to eat? Imagine a wife coming home and everyone coming home and saying, what is there to eat? And the response being what? Nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry. We don't have anything yet. I got to figure it out. Imagine how many of us would have the spiritual fortitude to smile, not fake it. You know, the fake smile where your mouth is there, but your eyes are like angry and you look a little bit weird, right? No, you really smile. You say, oh, you know what? Great, great. Not great like sarcastic great, great. But genuinely, alhamdulillah, I have an opportunity to fast. That's zuhud. So this man is saying, Ya Rasulullah, give me something I can do. 
that I can know that Allah loves me. And the Prophet ﷺ says, if you can be this person, if you can look at whatever car you have and say, Alhamdulillah, if you can look at whatever's on your plate and say, Alhamdulillah, if you can look at whatever clothes you have and say, Alhamdulillah, then that's part of the path of zuhud. I'm not going to lie. This morning, I had an irritation in my chest about something. Can I share with you guys? I was driving back in an Uber on the way back from a coffee shop, and I got in the, co the car, and the, uh, the, the driver started driving, and the coffee spilled all over my pants, right? Alhamdulillah, there was no burn or anything. But my pants had this massive coffee stain on it, and my son, who has really, really, unfortunately, he's very honest, says, Baba, it looks like you had an accident. It's the first thing he does when he sees me. I'm like, thanks, Musa, mashallah. And I'm not going to lie, right? As I, I, was, I was frustrated. I was irritated. It is what it is. You're not home. You can't just go change. This is maybe the only outfit that you had planned for the day. Whatever. You know, alhamdulillah. By the way, as I walk off the stage, please don't look at my left leg, okay? <laughs> and I got out of the car. You know what I see? I see two or three people sitting on the side of the road asking for money. And you wonder to yourself, is a stain on the leg of my pants really the biggest problem in the world right now? Right? Does anybody even care? And the answer you have to remind yourself is the thing that is bothering me, the thing that is causing me so much ingratitude to Allah at this moment, is literally the dream of somebody somewhere in the world today. There are millions of people who are hoping and begging for any clothes to wear, stain or not, for any food or drink. And Abdurrahman Murphy has the audacity before his Lord to sit and complain about a couple drops of coffee on his pants. May Allah forgive me. This is what zuhud means. You check yourself. You remind yourself. You work on that. And you know that Allah Ta'ala, as a result, will love you, insha'Allah. Then he gave the second advice. He said, Izhad fi dunya Allah wa izhad fi nas nas. That do that same action of zuhud, of being completely disinterested, not jealous or greedy or invested or curious or wanting anything that people have, give it up. And what is the result of that? People will love you. People will love you. And this is one of the truest statements, subhanAllah. If we are constantly thinking and looking at what others have, number one, it threatens our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What makes you not grateful to Allah is when you see someone else's station or status and you think to yourself, why can't I have that? This leads to one of the greater sins of the heart, hasad, envy, or jealousy. When a person looks at what Allah has given somebody else and says, why not me? I'll never forget my first car, a Toyota Camry, because I'm Muslim. <laughs> All right? And <laughs> on the, la the last line of the contract is the shahada, actually. You just, you have a Camry? Okay, come sign here. Ashhadu and la. So I drive, I'm driving off the lot, and I'm really excited. My first car, you know, I grew up not getting new cars, just driving whatever my brother had whenever, whenever I could, or borrowing a car here and there. No such thing as me having a car. So now this is my first car. Very excited. And uh, as I'm driving off the lot, I see across the street is a Lexus dealership. And at the same time, I'm pulling up to leave. Someone else is pulling up to leave in a Lexus. And this same car that I was so excited to get, because buying a car takes like 72 hours of being in a dealership. That was a joke. It doesn't actually take that long, but it feels that long. At the same car that I had so much excitement to have, I was so grateful to Allah. I felt like I was on top of the world. As soon as I saw that Lexus with the leather seats, and I was driving the Camry with like the cloth seats, the cloth started to feel more like wool. And the leather looks so good. And as I turned on my blinker, and I was turning left, and that Lexus was turning his left, and we 
we turned past each other. I said, man, my Camry sucks. And I had just gotten it. I'm not joking. Brand new. But that, that thought just floated through my mind. How more ungrateful, how completely invested in what people have could I have been in, in more than in that moment? And the sad thing is that when we do this to people that we know, and we know what they have, and they know how we feel, then what ends up happening is the relationship starts to crumble. Right? So many of this, many of these moments have to be things that are self-regulated. No one else can do this for you. No one else can come to you and say, you know what? Get that love of that thing out of your heart. They can't do that. You have to cleanse yourself from these moments and obsessions where your eyes cannot stop looking at the things that belong to your brothers or your sisters. And this happens far too often. So what can you do? Number one, how can you cleanse yourself from this? Number one, as Imam al-Ghazali says, the greatest, the greatest remedy for envy is you have to think to yourself, who is the one who decided to give you that in the first place? Allah. Allah knows what you can handle and what that other person can handle. And he gave you what you can handle, and he gave the other person what they can handle. And if he gave you what he gave somebody else, it might break you. So he didn't give it to you because he doesn't want you broken. He wants you whole. So that's number one. Number two is that you should realize that your responsibility when you see something nice for somebody else is to make dua for them and to say, Masha Allah. Masha Allah. This is what Allah wanted. This is what Allah willed. Allah gave it to them because it's for them. And he gave this to me because this is what I have. By the way, this ends up becoming more apparent in things where the resources are limited. When somebody gets married and you want to get married. When somebody buys a house and you want to buy a house. When someone's applying for a job and you are too and they get the job and you don't. This is when the envy starts to bubble up. So number two is make dua for them. And number three is to look at what you have already in your life and take away your eyes and your heart from being able to look at anything else that people have in their lives. Imam al-Ghazali said something really powerful one time. He said the eyes are effectively one of the quickest ways to the heart. And he said in his Ihya, he wrote this beautiful commentary on guarding your gaze. And he said that we typically talk about guarding the gaze with the opposite gender. He said there's another kind of ghadd al-basr that has to happen. That kind of ghadd al-basr, lowering the gaze, right? That kind of ghadd al-basr has to happen when it comes to the different belongings that people have. Don't stare at the things that people have in their lives. Don't look at the cars that your friends drive. Don't look at the phones that they have. Don't look at the clothes that they wear. He's not saying don't look at them. He's saying don't obsess over them. Don't stare. Don't let them occupy the vacancy in your heart to the point where you can't stop but think how much you want you to have that and you don't want them to have that. So work on lowering the gaze in general from what people have. If somebody has something that you like, then say, MashaAllah. It's okay for you to want it as well. It's okay for you to want it as well as them. But never ask Allah to remove something from the life of somebody else because that is the epitome of hasad. So the Prophet Sallallahu said that this kind of detachment will ensure that number one, Allah will love you. And number two, that people will love you. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to give us this and more to make us successful in our endeavors, to allow us to become people who follow his example, the example of his messenger, alayhi wa sallam. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Jazakum Allah khairan wa salam wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.